first speaker that I'd like to welcome is Dr. Lindsay Runstadt. Uh, Dr. Runstadt is a research ecologist with the USDA's Forest Service. Uh, she's also the co-director of the USDA Northeast Climate Hut Hub, excuse me, and a team leader for the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. Uh, Lindsay received a BA in philosophy at Cornell University and an MS in forest science at the Yale School of Environment and her PhD in plant science um, at the University of Maine. Uh, Lindsay's areas of expertise um, include climate change impacts on forest, biogeochemistry, advanced environmental sensor systems, and the integration of art and science. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lindsay Rutstadt, who will share of the peril and hope reflections on climate, on changing climate. So with that, Dr. Rudstadt, you're welcome to share your uh, screen and upload your presentation and the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. And I am just gonna start with technology and share my screen. And if it's up there, I, I had said that I was going to turn my video off to save on bandwidth, but I, I'm going to try and leave it on just so you have a, a face with a name. If I run into uh, troubles, I'll go ahead and, and turn it off. So um, anyway, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it really is great to be here virtually. Um, let me just shift something here. Bear with me. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to say this is a uniquely, and excuse me, I have other things going on in the background. There, my technology. What I wanted to say is this is a uniquely poignant talk for me as I grew up in Port Jefferson, uh, which is on the north shore, shore of Long Island. And even though I left after high school about 46 years ago, and don't do the math, uh, once a Long Islander, uh, always a Long Islander. Um, and again, I have to change some things in my screen over here. Okay, let me try that. So um, anyway, I, I wanted to start uh, by telling you guys a secret. And uh, that is that although I've been giving climate change talks for over 20 years, I have never ever used the words peril before or unequivocal or pending disaster or even irreversible. In fact, um, I was the epitome of those dorky scientists in Leon DiCaprio's movie, Don't Look Up. And if I was in the room with you, I would ask for a show of hands um, to see who has actually seen the movie. And if you've seen it, I think you know what I mean. And if you haven't seen it, the movie is a metaphor for climate change. And it's about a nerdy astronomy professor and his grad student who make an astounding discovery about a comet AKA climate change that is hurtling towards the earth. But because it's so far away and it can't be seen with the naked eye, it's really hard to get people concerned about what is coming, at least until it is right over them and perhaps too late. Well, I'm here to say that if we look up, the comet or climate change is in plain sight and that's the peril. But there's still time, I think, and scientists think, to deploy our tools to avert the worst of climate impacts. And that's the hope. So uh, today, I want to um, share with you a little bit about my journey, if you will, just one climate scientist amongst thousands. And then I want to go over some of the basic facts of climate, of climate science, just that we're all on the same page. And then I'll talk about the current state of knowledge and why we are in this point of peril. And then finally end with my hopes of what we can do to avert the worst of the climate crisis. So um, as Polly said, um, uh, a little bit about me, I am a forest ecologist and a climate scientist with the USDA Forest Service. And I have spent the better part of the last 30 years trying to understand what makes northern forests tick and particularly how forests respond to and recover from large scale disturbances like air pollution, climate change and extreme weather events. 
So um, speaking of that climate change comment, it was first coming into view in the late, 18, uh, late 80s, early 90s, just when I was finishing my PhD. And it was then that alarm bells were beginning to go off about rising atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and its effects on climate. And there was a suggestion that maybe, just maybe, we were already seeing a small increase in mean global temperature with no understanding at all of coincident changes in perception precipitation or extreme weather events. We could see the comment in our scientific telescope, but it was pretty darn fuzzy. However, that didn't stop us from starting to try to understand what was coming. And my colleagues and I conducted one of the first ever forest warming experiments where we strung several miles of warming cable through a forest soil to warm the soils five degrees C above ambient to begin to simulate a warmer world. And results, no surprise, showed that warming had a significant impact on the carbon cycle, particularly by enhancing processes like soil respiration, litter decomposition, nitrogen cycling, all of which in turn had direct feedbacks to the warming climate. So uh, we were not alone. Uh, by the late 1900s and early 2000s, there were literally thousands of global change experiments on the world, uh, some of which are shown on this map. And to process the onslaught of information, myself and colleagues formed what we call the Research Coordination Network called TERAC, or Terrestrial Ecosystem Response to Atmospheric and Climate climatic change. And through TERAC, we did three things. We won, we brought together the international community of researchers performing global change experiments. Two, we synthesized a tremendous amount of data from around the world. And three, we significantly moved the needle forward on mechanistically understanding the climate change and its impacts on ecosystems. And perhaps uh, most importantly, through this, we, pr we provided input to the increasingly sophisticated cadre of ecosystem and earth system models that we still use and keep uh, building on to understand climate change and its impacts today. So in 1997, I had the great good fortune to start my work at the Hubbard Burke Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. And again, if I was there, I would ask for audience participation and I would say, who's ever heard of Hubbard Brook and who's ever been to Hubbard Brook? Um, but if you haven't, it's a 3,200 hectare outdoor laboratory located in the heart of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And you can see the valley here in the photo on the left and we're just losing uh, the last of our snowpack. So the Hubbard Brook was established by the USDA Forest Service in 1955 as a center for hydrologic research for the region, and it has since grown to be one of the longest continuously running, most comprehensive, and of course I'm very biased, uh, so one of the most famous ecological study sites um, in the world. So at Hubbard Brook we do um, lots of things, but two main things. We do long-term monitoring and we do experiments. So long-term monitoring is hugely important because it is one of our principal records of change over time. So climate, trees, soils, geology, they all change slowly, right, on the orders of decades to centuries to millennia. You need to study them for a long time to make what I think these largely unseen changes seen. You also have to study them for a long time so you know what is normal, right? So you can detect or pick out what is not normal or what's extreme. So experiments, on the other hand, complement this, and they allow us to use a scientific method to investigate cause and effect relationships, and they allow us to simulate future conditions and to provide more detailed input to those models that I keep talking about. So one of the unique parts of Hubbard Brook is we monitor uh, not just one or two ecosystem components, but a whole suite of properties, including meteorology, soils, vegetation, heterotrophs, aka animals, um, and water. And through this work, uh, we have been able to document over the decades um, on the local level, the long-term changes in these properties. And I just have time for two quick examples here. Um, so the first is of course, air temperature. And you can see um, on the top graph on the right that not surprisingly, air temperatures increased at Hubbard Brook by almost two degrees C, almost three and a half degrees Fahrenheit over 64 years of record. Uh, we've also been able to see that warming is greater in the winter than the other seasons. 
and that winter low temperatures are warming the fastest. That is our winter nights are warming the fastest. This warming has of course a cascade of consequences for the ecosystem, including making the habitat more suitable, right? For a growing number of pests, pathogens and invasive species. The second example is precipitation shown in this lower graph. And as in other parts of the Northeast and Long Island, precipitation has been increasing at Hubbard Brook. And by Hubbard Brook, it's increased by a whopping 11 inches over the past 64 years. We're also seeing that more of this precipitation is coming in larger events, right? Separated by longer periods of rain. So this is resulting ironically in a drier forest in a wetter world. So we also conduct experiments. At Hubbard Brook, we have a long history of conducting large whole watershed or large plot experiments. And if you think about it, you can't study a forest in a test tube in a day. So trees are large, right? They're upwards of 70 to 80 feet and they live a long time, upwards of 100, 300 or more years. So at Hubbard Brook, we've conducted large whole watershed manipulation experiments um, going back to the 60s, 70s, 80s on topics of forest harvest and acid rain. But more recently, we've been conducting a suite of climate change experiments, including simulating forest droughts, warming, and even conducting our very own ice storm experiment. Our goal is to create conditions where we can study the forests of tomorrow, but today. We, of course, publish um, our results in peer-reviewed papers, but they also provide what we call the best available science or the foundation for global, national, regional, and local syntheses uh, like the ones I show here. And these in turn are being increasingly distributed to the frontline users of inf information like all of you folks, right? By organizations such as the USDA Climate Hubs. As Polly mentioned, um, one of the hats that I wear is I'm a co-director of the Northeast Climate Hub. And as a co-director, I encourage you all to check out the resources at our site and the URL is down there at the bottom. So I share all of that so you have a glimpse into the life of a climate scientist and what we do at the local scale. And I just want you let to, to let you know that there are, of course, thousands of scientists out there like me, and of course, our next speaker who have devoted our lives and our careers uh, to studying the phenomena of climate change. And so with that, I want to backtrack just a bit, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same uh, basic footing on climate change. And so forgive me if I go back too far, I know you're all scientists, but it's just super important to remember that the root cause of climate change are simple molecules, right? Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water, which together, right, make up less than 2% of our atmosphere. And we have known for over 150 years from the work of Tyndall, Arrhenius, and others about the heat trapping properties of these gases. So we know, for example, that these molecules have that property where visible light coming from the sun goes right through their molecular structure, but radiant energy coming back up from the earth is trapped and eventually reflected back down to earth, effectively raising the temperature of the planet. This creates what we've called the greenhouse effect. And this is a good thing because without these gases, our planet would be plunged into a deep freeze, but it can be a bad thing when we add more of these gases to the atmosphere and alter what we think of as the natural balance. So since carbon is a major component of two of the major heat trapping gases, carbon dioxide and methane, we scientists have spent a lot of time trying to understand the global carbon cycle. So we know, for example, the approximate magnitude of the pools of carbon in the ocean, uh, land, and the atmosphere, shown here in blue. And we know approximately how much carbon is taken up by the land and sea, shown here in green. And we know about how much carbon is released back to the atmosphere by plant and soil respiration and from the oceans. And finally, we know approximately how much excess carbon is being released to the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels and changes in land use, particularly the coming down of a forest shown here in red. And so it is this excess uh, what we call anthropogenic or man-made carbon that is causing CO2 to build up in our atmosphere and hence cause global climate change. So we have a really good understanding of these pools and fluxes. 
We also know a lot about how these gases have changed over the millennia, right? So for example, we know for a fact that atmospheric CO2 has bounced around a lot over the last million years or so. And we know this to be true because scientists have actually measured CO2 in ancient air, trapped in gas bubbles that have been extracted from cores from the Antarctic ice sheet. So even though it's bounced around, right, for the last million years, we know for a fact that it's been below 300 parts per million for all that time, with an average somewhere below 250 parts uh, per million. We also know that atmospheric CO2 began to rise in the beginning of the 1800s, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And we know for a, for a fact from measurements all over the globe that it's at about 417 parts per million right now today, already way higher than it's been for the last million years. We also know that uh, temperature from a variety of reconstructions at temperature has closely tracked CO2 for the majority of this period. And of course, that's created the, the periods of glacier and interglacial periods that we all uh, know about. So if 800,000 years is too hard to imagine, we can also zoom into the last 1,000 years. Again, you can see CO2 in blue hovering well below 300 parts per million till about 1800, and then rising steadily to 417 parts per million where it is now. And temperature, which is shown here, is what we call that temperature anomaly, which is a temperature in, every year, in any year compared to, in this case, 1986, 1968, excuse me, 1865 to 1995 mean. And we know temperature bounces around, but it clearly began to rise again with rising CO2 in the, in the 1800s. And our temperature is now 1.1 degrees C or about two degrees Fahrenheit over where it was a hundred years ago. We know that for a fact. Looking to the future, uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have a pretty good idea of where we're going. Our projections are built on increasingly sophisticated Earth system models that we've been working on for decades, those models I was talking about, that couple processes occurring on the land, the ocean, and the atmosphere. And we run these models on a range of increasingly sophisticated emission pathways, which are now called the Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, or the SSPs. And I apologize for the jargon, and I'm just going to call them the pathways. Uh, going forward. So these emission pathways are based on things like projected fossil fuel use, conservation practice, and population growth. For carbon dioxide, under the most aggressive reductions in fossil fuel emissions, we might be able to stabilize atmospheric CO2 at close to current levels by the end of this century. But under the business as usual pathway, we may see CO2 concentrations go as high as a thousand parts per million, right, by the end of the 21st century. And remember the context, CO2 concentrations average below 300 parts per million for most of the last million years. So for temperature, these same models suggest that global temperature will rise by about 1.4 degrees C under the low emission pathway and upwards of 4.5 degrees C under the business as usual pathway. Now, if all countries can hit their targets under the Paris Accord, we might be able to stabilize uh, kind of at this middle pathway shown in yellow, uh, yellow here, with CO2 concentrations around 550 parts per million and a global temperature rise of 2.8 degrees C by the end of the century. However, even though this is well below the business as usual pathway, it is still troubling. And that's because the Paris Agreement aimed to keep the temperature rise below two degrees C to avoid irreparable harm to our planet as we know it. And a follow-up report said 1.5 degrees C, right, should be the target. Case in point, we are currently following the business as usual scenario and we're a long, long way from hitting not only the Paris Accord, but certainly these more stringent targets. 
So people ask me all the time, right? They say, why do we care about what seems like a really small change in temperature? And it's because small changes in temperature can cause, cause large changes in energy and water balance. I like to think about it as the old pot on the stove, right? When you add energy, we can think about the water molecules start moving around and they eventually hit a raucous boil and they start changing phase and turning to steam. So I think of, as, of our earth as being in that pot and we are slowly turning up the heat, putting more energy into the atmosphere, changing our water balance and leading to bigger and more frequent extreme events like floods, droughts and big wind events. So the final point I want to make is we have a pretty good idea of what's driving climate change. Sometimes we call it radiative forcing. And this is the newest figure from the latest IPCC report, which I'll talk about a little bit more on coming up. Um, and as a consumer of climate change literature, this type of figure has been around for decades and the science behind it just keeps getting bigger. So um, to zoom in up to the, the part on the right, you can see that radiative forcing both positive in red and negative in blue. And the lines or the whiskers are just the range of the estimates from the models. So for me, the take homes are that one, scientists have a pretty good idea of what is and what is not causing the increase in mean global temperature. And the main positive drivers are the well-mixed heat trapping gases of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, as well as volatile organic carbons and a little bit over here on the right from black carbon. And we also have negative drivers or cooling, and these are the nitrous and sulfur oxides and changes in surface reflection, or what we call albedo. So I'm now going to step way back, um, not just the local view like I presented from Hubbard Dork, but a, a planetary view. And from this elevation, it is unequivocal that our planet is changing. So for example, in the last hundred years, we have witnessed um, an increase in heat trapping gases, increase in global temperature, intensification of the water cycle, changes in the amount, the distribution, the timing, even the phase of precipitation, the melting of glaciers and ice sheets, the rising sea levels, acidification of oceans, right, and the intensification of storms. We also know a lot about the impacts of changing climate on our biosphere. So we know that we're seeing changes in where plants and animals are found. So changes in the distribution, they're moving north in latitude, right, and up in elevation. We're seeing change in when and where animals migrate, right? They're migrating sooner, they're migrating further north, they're staying longer. We're seeing a loss of plants and animals entirely. We call this extinction. And we don't escape um, from these changes. So on a societal basis, we are seeing an increase in societal inequities and, and um, environmental injustice, right? Some of the, the poorest countries in the world are seeing some of the greatest impacts of climate change, even though they didn't contribute uh, to the makings of that climate change. And finally, as we see more extreme events, say more droughts, we're seeing more impacts on crops, crop fa failures can lead to social unrest and social unrest is eventually going to lead, of course, to armed com conflict. <laughs> but there's more. Uh, since last August, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, has released its sixth assessment report, but the final document on, on mitigation re released uh, just last Monday. So I apologize. If you're not familiar with it, the IPCC is an international organization established by the United Nations back in 1988 to provide the world with clear scientific information on climate change and its environment environmental and socioeconomic impacts. Since 1990, the IPCC has released six climate assessment reports at about five to seven year intervals. And these aren't just any report. They represent the efforts of thousands of scientists from around the world, consi consolidating all that we know about climate change in one place. And each report is thousands of pages. And I have to say, as a climate nerd, I have read each and every one of them, although I'm still working a little bit on the sixth assessment report. Um, but the recent news is not just bad, but it's really bad. 
it's we can see the comet in the sky bad. So a couple highlights, if you can call them highlights from this report. Uh, one, it is unequivocal that the Earth's climate is warmed by 1.1 degrees C and that that warming is caused by us. Even more concerning is that the rate of warming is accelerating. We now know also unequivocally that these changes have already worsened extreme weather events around the world, such as droughts, floods, heat waves, and storms. And we can increasingly attribute these changes directly to climate change. In fact, there's a whole new discipline now that we call attribution science. We also know that these changes are impacting, right, the physics, biology, and chemistry of our planet's land, oceans, and ice sheets. And we know for sure that we continue to, to we're continuing to emit these heat trap and gases into the atmosphere. And we know that there's more to come. I showed you that in the emission pathways before. Um, and as we emit more of these, we know that global and ocean temperatures are going to continue to rise. The water cycle will continue to intensify. And what we used to think of is uh, what we used to think of as extreme weather are going to become the new normal. So perhaps most concerning, if that wasn't enough, is the report suggests that the climate system is getting closer to causing changes that are irreversible in our lifetimes or our kids' lifetimes or our grand or great grandkids' lifetimes. So changes like the, extinct, the extinction of species, so we can't get them back once they're gone. The loss of coral reefs, they won't come back in our lifetime. The loss of forests due to heat, drought, fire, or saltwater encroachment, uh, they won't come back in our lifetime. And finally, the loss of glaciers and ice sheets that might take millennia to redevelop. So some people ask me if, as a climate scientist, if I have any hope for the future. And so I always say yes, both from the heart and from the mind. I say yes from the heart because as a mother of three, an aunt of six, and a grandmother now of one, my answer has to be yes. And I say yes from the mind as a climate scientist for three reasons. So the first, as I showed you, is we have the facts and knowledge. So I came of age in the 20th century, and we had the amazing knowledge to put a man on the moon, it was a man, to split the atom, to unravel the secrets of DNA, AKA life, and to launch the green revolution. Our knowledge base now in the 21st century on interactions between the atmosphere, oceans, and land is equivalent or greater to those that fostered the scientific breakthroughs of the 20th century. We have the knowledge. Two, we know how to adapt to and to mitigate from climate change. So for adaption, uh, adaptation, we know how to protect our natural systems and to provide water, food, and energy security. We know how to prepare our health systems for new climate normals. We know how to adapt our buildings and other infrastructure to withstand the norms of new climate extremes. And we're learning how to think about environmental justice. And I guess we thought we were learning how to keep world peace. Not so sure about that anymore. Um, and we're at least talking about things like planned climate migrations of people and reparations to those countries most affected by climate change who didn't actually contribute to its cause. We also know how to mitigate climate change. That is to make it less worse. We can mitigate by increasing carbon sinks, right? With natural climate solutions, there's so many that we can do in built materials and with new negative emission or direct carbon capture technology. We can also mitigate by decreasing carbon sources, right? So we know how to decrease emissions from energy systems, transportation, food systems, heating and cooling, land systems. We know we can recycle more. We know we can use less. And we're increasingly knowing how to deploy new technologies such as solar radiation management. And third, um, we increasingly have, I believe, the will to change. Increasingly, federal, state, and local agencies, as well as private and publicly held corp uh, corporations, are creating climate action plans and net zero goals 
uh, that rely on that host of proven natural and engineered solutions that I just mentioned that we know can reduce emissions and we know can increase carbon uptake. And increasingly, these same groups are suggesting ways to adapt to that changing climate, both to avoid negative impacts, but also to take advantage of new opportunities that present themselves under not novel climate conditions. So not all climate change is bad, but it's complex, right? We'd be naive to say that it wasn't. So we need individual actions, such as changes in lifestyle and changes in demand for consumer products and services. And we need this to coordinate with local, state, and federal policies, right? Such as regulations on one hand and providing services on the other. And we need this to coordinate with initiatives from private industry, such as net zero strategies, low carbon projects, and energy efficient alternatives. So in sum and to wrap up, um, my reflection is we've come a heck of a long way in the 30 years of my career. And we're at the point where we have the facts and knowledge. We know what actions we need to take. We increasingly have action plans, but the comet is here. And we need to take action and we need to take that action now. If not for us, right? For those little people that are coming after us. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. I know it's always uh, difficult in Zoom. And I'll stop sharing. I hope you're all still there. We are. Thank you very much for uh, your excellent presentation. Uh, I think those uh, areas that you went through of uh, the knowledge, uh, where we can find the information and the references for climate change, uh, what we can do to take action and uh, really the outlook of um, the challenges that we have in, and moving forward, but with the, with the hope that we can. So thank you for your time um, in presenting and sharing your information with us, Dr. Rustad. So moving forward, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jonathan Lair. Dr. Lair is the chair, uh, chairperson of the Department of Urban Horticulture and Design at Farmingdale State College on Long Island. His teaching and academic interests uh, center on the diversity of ornamental plants and contemporary challenges that seek to al alter our palette of functional landscape species. Uh, a native Long Islander, Dr. Lair was trained at Cornell University and the University of Connecticut before he uh, moved back to Long Island. He has been very active with, the, with LISMA, especially on our scientific review committee. And he's been a great mentor and leader in training the next generation of horticulturalists, many of which Limpy has hired as staff as interns for our plant materials production activities. So with that, I would like to please uh, welcome Dr. Lair as he shares about shifting sands and climate change and plant distribution. So I turn it over to you, Dr. Lair. Great, Holly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes. Good. Yep, Excellent. I can hear you clearly. So you Wonderful. just want to um, turn your slideshow on because right now we're yep. seeing your full uh, preview. There you go. Perfect. Oh, good. Yep. Good to okay. go. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I want to I want to thank Polly for the uh, the wonderful introduction, and I want to thank Lisma and the sponsors for uh, inviting me uh, today. I'm also uh, really pleased that I was able I'm able to follow. Uh, Dr. Rustad, because uh, the information and the background that she presented is really um, a wonderful foundation for what I'm going to be talking about uh, here today. So what I'm going to be talking, addressing is how these um, indisputable changes in our climate and the rising in temperature that we have been witnessing, what are some of the effects on the ground, quite literally, in terms of plant distribution and what are some of the um, changes that we can expect uh, going forward. So I am a horticulturist, uh, you know, here in the Department of Urban Horticulture and Design at Farmingdale State College. So obviously uh, I tend to look at things uh, in part through sort of a horticultural lens. And, you know, when, we, when we're looking at uh, temperature and plants, we typically use um, average annual minimum temperatures as sort of our primary 
determinant as to how plants are going to be growing. So obviously we're interested as horticulturists in sort of um, guaranteeing or at least um, emphasizing our chances of having plants survive in a given location. So what we've been using since the midway part of the 20th century are these cold hardiness maps. And I'm sure everybody who's um, attending today is familiar with these maps, if, if only in passing, uh, you know, in the back of a glossy plant catalog, you see this map. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with how it generally works. But basically, the uh, United States or any geographic area is defined into different zones. And those zones are calculated by taking a data set which measures the average annual minimum temperature over a period of years. So these maps have been created and introduced repeatedly over the last uh, 70, 80 years or so. The most recent one was released in 2012. So we're due for a, uh, an update, hopefully sometime uh, fairly soon. And the map utilizes data from the previous 20, 30 years, weather station data, looking at the average annual minimum temperature. And that's how these zones are calculated. And we can see over time, and I'll show you that in a moment, how these zones have migrated. And of course, that's in response to the global climate change that Dr. Rustad uh, so eloquently uh, described in the last, uh, the last uh, half an hour or so. So it's also important to realize that while our climate variables, while our functional temperature is changing, that plants cannot change so quickly. So the cold hardiness or the ability of plant species to tolerate, thrive, and reproduce at given temperatures, that's a genetic trait. So obviously plants like palm trees which come from, let's say, the Amazon uh, rainforest, those plants are going to have a different tolerance for cold and warm temperatures as opposed to pine trees and birch trees that are found growing in the northern hemisphere, you know, in the um, green mountains of, uh, of New Hampshire. And that's because of thousands and thousands of years of evolution. Those plants have adapted to their environment but they cannot adapt in the period of five years, 10 years, 100 years, even 1,000 years. So while we may be changing the climate very quickly, and we are, plants cannot change their genetic preferences for temperature nearly as quickly. And therefore, that creates problems and that creates change. And that's what I'm going to be exploring here over the next, um, next 20, 20 minutes, half an hour or so. So what we can see here is I've basically found some published uh, maps showing how these cold hardiness zones have changed over time. And one of the easiest ways to visualize this is if we start at the, uh, the top uh, map here, if we look at the right at Texas, you can see that 20, 30, 40 years ago that Texas had at the top part of the state some of what we call USDA cold hardiness zone six. And you can see that that is shaded green. And if you then follow down to the present map on the middle, and then at the bottom, what's projected for the future, you can see that those colored zones and especially the green zone six is migrating northward to the point where in the future, it is forecast that there will no longer be any zone six in the state of Texas, it will simply be zone seven, eight, and nine. So what we're seeing, and uh, Dr. Rust had mentioned it briefly earlier, is that the zones or temperature is migrating north. Basically, it's getting warmer and warmer the, north, the farther north that we go. And if we look at this map here, and I apologize, it's a little bit out of focus, but this shows it in, a, in perhaps a slightly more powerful way, because here we have two iterations of the USDA cold hardiness map, the version that was released in 1990 and the, the current version that was released in 2012. And if you simply kind of gaze back and forth with your eyes, 
you can see how each of the colored zones is moving north. So the green color is moving north, that's the zone six. The yellow color is moving north, that's the zone seven. But it's probably easiest to visualize if you look at the northern tier, places like Montana and North, uh, North Dakota and, and Minnesota, and you can see how the blues, the zones three and four, are also steadily moving north to the point where going forward, there may no longer be any zone three, even in the continental United States, because these zones are moving north. Or another way of saying it is our warm zones are moving north. And again, this is just another way of estimating and charting what Dr. Rustad was saying earlier, how we are getting north, uh, warmer the further north you go, and not only the further north you go, but also the higher in elevation you go, obviously it's getting much warmer even on mountaintops and alpine areas than it was only 30, 40 years ago. If we focused uh, just quickly here on the Metro New York City area, you can see that back in 1990, we were placed in zone six slash seven. Now we are solidly in a zone seven and going forward, we're already working ourselves towards a zone eight. So yes, we are getting warmer. We are having changes by the magnitude of five to 10 degrees in our minimum temperature uh, witnessed now than we had even in the 1970s and 1980s. So obviously uh, we're getting um, much more warm, much more toasty as we go forward here. So what are some of the actual consequences of this that we can witness uh, now and that we can predict will go forward? How will the distribution of plants change and what will be some of the effects of that? Well, one of the really disturbing things that we're seeing, and this has been observed already for, for many decades, is that the range distribution, the native range of many species, especially species that come from more boreal northern climates, that these species, they are retreating northward. And one of the sort of poster children for this phenomenon is sugar maple. Sugar maple obviously is a very common, well-known uh, native tree. It's a keystone species in many of our uh, deciduous northern forests. It's obviously important economically for uh, lumber production, for maple syrup, for leaf peeping uh, in the fall. It's a big industry in places like Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, this idea of uh, you know uh, sugar maples. And you can see here, looking at these maps, that based both on current predicted changes in temperature combined with current predicted changes in moisture availability that we expect by 2070, that, that date is not on here, but I believe by 2070 that the range of sugar maple could retreat so far north that the species may no longer be highly viable in parts of Southern and Central New England. So, you know, um, sugar maple festivals in, uh, you know, Vermont and New Hampshire may be uh, in dire, in dire uh, you know, threat. And of course, that's a superficial, you know, consequence. It will have much greater consequences on an ecological and conservation scale. And we, and we see this phenomenon not only with sugar maple, but if we look at many other northern uh, woody plant species like paper birch, Canadian hemlock, even red oak, we're noticing that plants are becoming much more stressed in the southern parts of their range. They're showing less degrees of fitness, less seedling recruitment, and functionally, the range of these plants is starting to move northward. One of the reasons for this is a um, an aspect of plants that is often not as appreciated. And, you know, in horticulture and many other areas, we often focus on the tolerance of plants for cold temperatures. And that's important because the ability of plants to tolerate freezing temperatures in cold temperate regions, that is the greatest limiting factor that determines what plants we can grow and how they'll perform. But in the last 50 years or so, there's been a lot more attention paid to the idea of heat hardiness. This idea that while plants may have a tolerance that's limited for cold temperatures, they also have a tolerance and a limit 
as to what they can accept with warm temperatures. And this map here was one of the first attempts to quantify this idea of heat hardiness. It was actually published by the American Horticultural Society back in 1997. It has never been updated, so it's sort of obsolete. But as I tell my students, the main utility of this map was that it put the idea of heat hardiness in sort of the public discourse. And it made us realize that we have to consider the impact of heat on plants, just as we've always focused on the tolerances for cold temperatures. The last thing I'll mention about heat hardiness is it's often a slow killer. It's kind of like cardiovascular degree disease in people in that it can be difficult on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis seeing the impact of heat on plants. But over time, what happens is the plants begin to lose their vigor, their roots begin to die back. And over time, they start to uh, succumb and eventually be lost in a given area. So it's a, a slow killer. Uh, heat hardiness. So, you know, just as we're going to be over time seeing some of our northern species migrate northward and perhaps even out of the United States, we see the same um, continuity when we look at our southern native species. And many people have noticed that over the last century, typical southern species, uh, common uh, forest trees like American sweet gum and tulip tree, liriodendron and, and liquid ambar, their range has been steadily moving north. Now you might say, well, you know, how is this happening so quickly? We know that changes in plant distribution take a lot of time. Well, that's because we have helped this process. So plants like sweet gum and tulip tree have been planted far north of their native range as horticultural and landscape subjects. And what we've seen is that those plants are now so well adapted to places in New York, New England, that they have now become a naturalized species. They are reproducing on their own. There's natural seedling recruitment. They're basically becoming part of the flora far north of where we would have expected them to be maybe only 75, 100 years ago. Uh, even the um, a more exotic native plant, the umbrella magnolia, which you see pictured there in the center, which is a, a beautiful uh, ornamental tree. It's amazing even on Long Island how this plant has naturalized from cultivated uh, populations. So people would plant it, it would be, it would escape by virtue of birds and rodents eating the seeds. And now we're seeing it proliferate, expand into colonies without any uh, emphasis on, uh, without any attention by people. So it's an example of range expansion. And of course, that may be from a superficial ornamental perspective, that might be a nice thing, but obviously there's going to be consequences, which we don't uh, perhaps uh, foresee and can't predict as to what the sort of introgression of these more southerly species into the local flora, what are going to be the effects of that in the long run. And that's going to be very difficult, of course, uh, to predict. Also, uh, perhaps more alarmingly, we're seeing that the invasive range of naturalized species, especially exotic naturalized species, is also changing. So obviously we're talking about invasive species, those non-native plants, which have been introduced primarily by people for ornamental purposes, and they've established naturalized populations, which can expand without any uh, attention on our part. And of course, many of these plants uh, can be proven to have detrimental effects on the local ecosystem, and therefore they're often declared to be of a biological invasive uh, potential. So here we have three plants, Japanese spirea, golden rain tree, and uh, calorie pear, which is blooming as we speak, opening up its flowers as we speak all across the area. These are plants which are known to be naturalized and invasive very widely in states south of New York and New England. But what we're seeing, and we can see this on the ground uh, even in the last few years, is that more and more new naturalized populations, sightings, occurrences of these plants are uh, cropping up right here in our local area. 
And I'm sure as local municipalities and states uh, begin to review and update their invasive plant uh, legislation, that these three species, as well as several others, will start to make their way onto regulated and prohibited plant lists as the uh, potential for these plants in our local area is, is realized. So uh, obviously that's somewhat uh, disturbing, uh, but at the same time enlightening to know that you know, the, the range of invasive species that we can expect to see going forward will also change as our climate uh, changes. And you know, obviously, uh, my expertise is, is plants. But you know, as we know, plants and insects uh, go hand in hand. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Tallamy has uh, proven that uh, beyond reasonable doubt. And uh, pe people have a very you know close uh, are paying close attention now to insects, whether they be pollinators or insect pests or invasive insect pests like emerald ash borer. And here we have something that I'm sure most all of you are familiar with. But here we have an insect, which is actually a native southern forest insect, the southern pine beetle, which has been present in the southern part of the United States for tens of thousands of years and previously was not found this far north, probably because if it had been introduced in years prior, it was unable to survive our winters. But this insect was has been unfortunately introduced uh, to Long Island and back in 2014, not that long ago, uh, it was first identified and sighted in the Pine Barrens. And as I'm sure, again, you're all aware, it has gone on already to be quite disastrous in many areas, you know, striking down tens of thousands of uh, pitch pine trees, which form the foundation of the, uh, the Pine Barrens on Long Island, also the, the Albany Pine Bush. And again, this is an example of the invasive the range expansion of invasive insects. And as they move further north, they're going to have impacts, which again, we cannot predict, but unfortunately it's most likely not going to be uh, anything of a positive virtue. And when I was looking at this map last night, I was really, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, un it was, I was un unhappy to see that there's already been uh, some uh, initial sightings of this Southern pine beetle even as far north as the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. I don't know if it's been proven yet to be able to survive the winters up there because obviously it's at least one or two zones uh, more uh, colder that far north, but uh, it's probably only a matter of time until the insect hatches on up there and then it's gonna be another unfortunate ecological uh, calamity in, the, in that unique ecosystem uh, further north. Another interesting aspect of um, global warming and its impact on plant distribution is something that um, you know I, I sort of uh, find very interesting and in, in, in my teaching and in my, in my research, this idea of the cultivated range of plants changing. So I always refer to the, the plants that we use in horticulture, design, ecological restoration. I refer to that as our plant palette. I guess I grew up with in the age of you know, Bob Ross and watching him paint on television and that idea of having a palette of paint, sort of a tool shed in your hand, that kind of stuck with me. So I call it our plant palette. And we are both losing and gaining plants in our functional plant palette. So while we may be losing plants like Canadian hemlock and paper birch, and many of the native fir species, abies, are no longer viable for us as landscape plants, we are also welcoming, whether intentionally or not, many new plants into our cultivated flora, plants that we're using actively in landscaping, uh, horticulture, ecological restoration, et cetera. And these fall into different categories. You know, it's very easy to look at exotic plants, you know, maybe more frivolous ornamentals, things like crepe myrtles and camellias, which were extremely rare to see in Long Island gardens when I was a kid only 40 years ago, but now they've become as commonplace as lilacs, azaleas, and daylilies. So why is that? Well, you know, these are two what we call marginally cold hardy plants. The coldest temperatures they can typically tolerate are what we call USDA cold hardiness zone seven, 
we, we were zone six years ago. Now we are in zone seven. So now these plants can survive here. And we're seeing that not only do they survive, but in many cases they thrive. It's not only true though of exotic plants, you know, as I showed you a bit earlier with the tulip tree and the sweet gum, our native plants from the south can also be brought here to our um, metropolitan area and they're showing uh, great signs of success. So Southern Magnolia, which is one of the characteristic, you know, trademark plants of the American South, that plant, which previously was too tender to be grown here, is now thriving. And you see Southern Magnolias being planted on many lawns and parking lots, and even more unusual local endemic plants, like, for example, what's known as the Florida anise or the hardy anise shrub, Elysium floridanum, which is the plant pictured there with the red flowers in the center of the screen. That's a plant that typically grows in the Florida panhandle and places in adjacent Mississippi and Alabama. You would never expect that a plant from that far south could survive up here, but it is actually cold hardy to zone 6B, 7A, and it actually can grow quite effectively on Long Island. Obviously, that opens up opportunities for landscaping, horticulture, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, that can also have unintended side effects as, well, what happens if these plants begin to naturalize? What impact may they have? But I also want to stress one last thing here as we get towards the end of my talk, that there may be unintentional uh, sort of maybe benefits or at least opportunities. So I mentioned earlier the unfortunate status of sugar maple as a native northern tree, which is slowly retreating northward in terms of its range. But it turns out that if you look at the uh, distribution of sugar maple, there are actually a few disjunct populations that occur further south that are basically range extensions, southern range extensions of sugar maple. They're known as the southern sugar maple or the Florida sugar maple. They're very closely related to our local northern sugar maple, but of course they evolved in areas much further south. And because of that, they have a much greater cold tolerance, I'm sorry, a much greater heat tolerance, excuse me, and they are actually well adapted to zones six, seven, eight, and nine. And, you know, it may seem uh, a poor substitute to grow a southern sugar maple up here, Acer floridanum, for example, on Long Island, but I can tell you that I've planted even here on the campus at Farmingdale a few specimens of these southern provenance uh, ecotypes of sugar maple, and they're actually doing quite well. So from an ecological perspective, that might not provide much consolation. The idea that we're maybe losing our local genetics of a native sugar maple, but it does show that there are alternatives and maybe even possibilities for having a plant that resembles and maybe even serves a similar ecological role, but maybe we simply need to look to some of these Southern genetic repositories and see if those plants can uh, perform a useful role up here in the uh, in the Northeast. So, you know, Dr. Laird, kind of, just you have five minutes left. Yep, yep, yeah, exactly. So as, as kind of a wrap up here, you know, what we what we've seen both with the my presentation and uh, before with, with Dr. Rustad is that, you know, things are going to change. And I think, again, I think everyone knew that long before they, they came to uh, the symposium here today. But in terms of the impact of um, global climate change on plant distribution, we are going to see, for example, new quote unquote native plants, new plants which will adopt this warmer uh, climate of Long Island, New York, New England, and behave as if they are native. On the flip side of that, we will see that other opportunistic, uh, exotic, invasive plants, which previously were relegated to areas further south, they may also find this new warmer uh, region to be to their liking. And in fact, we're already seeing that, you know, for example, calorie pear and Colruteria paniculata, the golden rain tree, are already showing themselves as escapes and feral naturalized plants in our local flora. There will also be opportunities uh, for horticulture, landscaping, even perhaps ecological restoration to use plants that come from warmer parts of the world 
or warmer parts of the United States as functional tools in our local environment. And of course, we'll be dealing with not only changes to our, uh, our flora, but also changes to our fauna, including, including new challenges such as uh, insect pests, pathogens, fungi, which previously were unknown in our area, which will now find the uh, environment suitable for their growth. So, you know, to, to, to end up, uh, just as my, uh, my predecessor was saying, it's really difficult to kind of predict exactly uh, what the outcome will be. People will be studying that, uh, you know, from, from here on in, but there will definitely be collateral ecological, ecological damage. There already has been, you know, as you know, disturbance brings about very uh, unpredictable changes. And climate change is acting as a huge overriding force of disturbance. It's perturbing any balance that we have in our ecosystem. And plants, animals, insects, bacteria are opportunistic. And there will be new niches, new opportunities for these organisms to spread, to uh, invade. And, you know, we're going to have to see where everything falls and what our new sort of, uh, our new normal is. And again, I hate to use that sort of trite trait. We've seen a, a trite phrase. We've seen a lot with COVID and everything. But yes, we're going to have a new normal with uh, ecology and plant distribution. And we'll all have to just kind of... Uh, sit back and see where the uh, where it sort of settles down. So uh, again, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Polly, the LISMA board, and everyone else for inviting me. I hope that uh, what I uh, presented here is somewhat enlightening and, and helpful. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Lair. That was a great presentation. I think that we can all agree that climate change, while alarming, is equally fascinating on uh, how quickly the species, um, native and non-native, do respond to um, the changing climate and uh, weather pattern shifts. Uh, we do have time for questions, so I would uh, ask that anyone has any questions for either um, uh, Dr. Lair, Dr. Rustad, um, to put them in the Q&A and we can put them up there. So we have one uh, question is how to decide whether to eradicate or cultivate new natives with quotation marks or treat them as invasives or let natural, success, natural selection slash succession progress. So uh, either one of you want to try tackling that question? I mean, I, I think that's it, that's a very uh, insightful question. I, you know, in true academic fashion, uh, you know, I can't really give a firm a firm answer to that. But I, I think, in many respects, it kind of comes down to uh, what your personal sort of perspective is. You know, so I understand that many folks want to um, cling to the idea of our native flora that's been with us for millennia and are resistant to accept changes to it. Uh, I, I, I understand that completely. But, you know, there is an emerging view of kind of urban ecology, which sort of, um, you know, takes into consideration the changes that we've made to the landscape and also the underlying forces of global climate change and sort of asks us to uh, accept or at least entertain the idea that we're going to see an inevitable shift in our uh, plant populations, in our sort of uh, ecosystems, and that, that that might just be an inevitable sort of stage of evolution, kind of like a new version of ecological succession, but in this case, a new stage of succession that's been uh, prompted, uh, promoted, and unfortunately encouraged by sort of anthropomorphic, you know, uh, forces, basically us. Dr. do you have anything to add to that question? Yes, it, it, it just brought to mind the, the concept of assisted migration, right? And, and even five years ago, that was kind of a, you know, a, a negative term in my world um, in terms of forestry. Um, but I, I would say that as we're looking at the speed of our changing climate and the SIX assessment report, 
they're really underscored. We're not seeing an increase, but we're an increase in things like temperature um, and, and precipitation, but it's accelerating. So I think we really have to embrace, kind of boldly embrace, you know, thinking about, you know, what our species assemblages are going to be. I mean, in the, in the forestry world, we, we have um, some, you know, climate smart forestry programs, um, adaptive silviculture for climate change, but we're setting these experiments up now and we're going to know the answers, you know, with forests maybe 20 years from now. And, and the reality is, is we need answers now. So I, I think we have to think that, you know, the best available science uh, that we have, you know, to think about, you know, what species you know, will do best, you know, on the lands landscape now um, and in the next decade or two to come. Great, thank you. And I, I think I would add to this uh, question is when you talk about new natives, you know, you, you'll sometimes see them referenced as neonatives, uh, reflective of, of the impact. So southern pine beetle would be a neonative, a species that's uh, moving out of its uh, home range into a new range driven by climate change um, and the variability of the impact that they're having on the new system based on the predator prey relationships. Um, that could otherwise um, reduce that, that spread. So um, that's one kind of foundational concept that's being applied to these emerging uh, neonatives or natives that are spreading outside their natural range. Um, we have a time for another question. Um, would you share the size of the Acer floriatum uh, trial plants and the source, Dr. Lair? Yeah, I mean, I have I, I appreciate the question. I haven't done a formal trial. I've really just, you know, uh, acquired a few uh, seedlings of those species and just planted them informally, you know, in the landscape here on the, the Farmingdale State College campus. But, uh, you know, I acquired them. One of the, one, an interesting source for unusual native plants is a nursery called Woodlanders. And Woodlanders is located down in Aiken, South Carolina. They do mail order. And they're a great source, especially for um, sort of southern ecotypes of native plants and unusual uh, southern endemics. So that's where I acquired the plants from. Uh, they've been in the ground here, I, I lose track of time, maybe seven or eight years. And uh, they started out maybe about knee high and they're already, uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 feet tall. So, uh, you know, they have performed very well, again, in this very informal, non-scientific uh, trial that I've uh, undertaken, but, uh, and, you know, other uh, investigators, Arboreta, have noted similar success, that many of these plants that are coming from uh, the, the parts of the mid and lower south are actually thriving on Long Island uh, in ways uh, that we didn't even anticipate. So, uh, you know, what, what that means for the future, obviously, uh, is up for debate. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? We still have uh, about five minutes for questions. Um, while, I, while I wait to see if any further come in, I can share further on the Southern Pine Beetle update that uh, Dr. Lair provided is there is an established population that has been documented in the Catskill region um, uh, and in state parklands, which state parks is uh, moving to eradicate. I believe there is between 100 and 300 infested uh, pitch pines in that area. So um, the species of southern pine beetle has moved north into the Catskills. Um, the detections have only been found in the northernmost areas in the Albany pine bush. There's been no active infestations uh, documented there as of yet. So, um, and Yuri, I, if you have those specific uh, site where um, the southern pine beetle establishment in the Catskills is, um, maybe you could throw that in the, the Q&A or the chat for folks, that would be helpful. There is a question in the chat. I don't know if you saw this, Polly, from Chris Neal asking. No, um, I don't see it, actually. I think he only sent it. It, he sent it to host and panelists, so it might, you might, I don't know if you see it over there, but he said, are there any comprehensive compendia that would allow one to pick and place and generate lists of what species might move out and what is likely to move in? Seems like that would become increasingly important. So if either of you want to take that. I'll, I'll, ta I'll take a stab at that I put in, in there um, for trees. Remember, I'm a forest ecologist. Um, Lewis Iverson's U.S. Forest Service, the Climate Tree Atlas. I don't know if, if you've seen that. They also have the climate bird 
atlas. I may not have that exactly right, um, but it's an incredibly uh, detailed uh, list by region of what the projected future um, climatic envelopes are for um, you know hundreds of, of species of trees. And of course, this is a climatic envelope approach, you know, where they do that statistical comparison between where things are now and what the climate is now. And then they take the future climate and use that statistical relationship to project where suitable habitat would be. So it's not exactly where these species are going to move to, but it's where their suitable habitat would move to. And um, boy, I, I encourage people to, to, to take a look at that. It's online at the Forest Service. Again, I think it's a climate tree atlas. And it, it's not, well, I don't know, they, they, they might have um, understory trees. Um, anyway, that was my quick response. Maybe Dr. Lair has, has other good sources. Dr. Rich, uh, then, I mean, if you had a link to that and could put it in the, um, in the chat, that would sure, be Sure, I'll find that. Yeah, no, I, I've seen many uh, individual, you know, maps and profiles taken from that resource. So that, that is a wonderful resource. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of any more sort of holistic, um, you know, book or database or website that kind of, you know, looks at all different plants, whether they're herbs or, you know, woody plants, et cetera, annuals to sort of do those projections. It's mostly, most of the information I see and read about is more sort of anecdotal or, you know, predictive, you know, individual books or articles, but I haven't, I can't really point, unfortunately, to a more sort of, uh, you know, concrete resource that could be, um, that could be referenced. Okay, any other questions? Um, I see Dr. Rostad did put the link for the, um, that tool for climate change in the chat. Uh, Haley, is everyone able to access the chat or should it be put, I guess the Q&A is only available to be seen by the hosts. So is that the appropriate location for people to pull it out of? That's what it looks like. I think I'm just gonna send this again to uh, make sure everyone can see it. I will say, I think, I'm not sure, this is uh, me just speaking about something I saw recently, but I think uh, CABI, C-A-B-I, not remembering what it stands for at the moment, but I know they do a lot of stuff with invasive species. Um, I think they have a horizon scanning tool that might be similar to that. I haven't had a chance to play around on that, but maybe we could all stand to look it up. <laughs> Great. And, and this this is Lindsay again. I mean, this is this is exactly the kind of question that the climate hubs are there to entertain. And as part of this, I'm going to go back to the Northeast Hub and say, hey, you know, this group had this question. Um, we could talk about the Climate Tree Atlas, and I can ask them um, if they you know, have other sources. Um, they're very plugged into extension. Um, and if I if I come up with other sources, I will send it to your group and let you know. And if there aren't, that's the kind of project that that we can undertake. You know, what what would that look like? What would be useful? Because that where the climate hubs are all about tools. Great. Well thank you both for your time uh, and your expertise and being willing to support uh, these invasive and native plant conference. Um, we're 